Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky. So, as usual, I'm going to read a little bit of the blurb, and I also, I watched the film today, so I read this in one go on an aeroplane yesterday, and then watched the film today, and I do have to say the book is better, but the film is also good. Uh, yeah, let's get to it, so I try and explain what the book is about. It's a coming-of-age story, basically. That's what you need to know. That's all I knew going into it. Charlie is a freshman, and while he's not the biggest geek in the school, he is by no means popular. Shy, introspective, intelligent beyond his years, yet socially awkward, he is a wallflower, caught between trying to live his life and trying to run from it. Charlie is attempting to navigate his world through uncharted territory, the world of first dates and mixtapes, family dramas and new friends, the world of sex, drugs and the Rocky Horror Picture Show, when all one requires is that perfect song or that perfect drive to feel infinite. But Charlie can't stay on the sideline forever. Standing on the fringes of life offers a unique perspective, but there comes a time to see what it looks like from the dance floor. The Perks of Being a Wallflower is a deeply affecting coming-of-age story that will spirit you back to those wild and poignant rollercoaster days known as growing up. I actually, while I'm at it, something to mention about the writer as well, and he also wrote the screenplay for the movie of it. Sorry, I'm fiddling with my hair because it's wet, don't mind me. And, uh, but I think it, the, the writer's had a, a fascinating life, and the, 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 the author bio captures it perfectly. So, Stephen Chbosky grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and graduated from the University of Southern California's filmic writing program. His first film, The Four Corners of Nowhere, premiered at Sundance Film Festival and went on to win Best Narrative Feature honours at the Chicago Underground Film Festival. He helped edit and contributed material to John Leguziamo's Broadway show Sexaholic. He also edited Pieces, a collection of short stories for pocket books. Most recently, he wrote the screenplay for the critically acclaimed film adaptation of Rent. He also co-created and served as executive producer of the post-apocalyptic drama Jericho, which found a place in television history when its cancellation prompted fans to send over £40,000 of nuts to the network in protest. The Perks of Being a Wallflower is his first novel. Now, another thing that I kind of thought about this so I read this. I'm going to compare it to Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda because I read that back in February, and it's a very similar thing in terms of it's a coming of age story, kind of set in a school for the most part and following school kids, and uh, it's written mostly in the form of letters or in the case of Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda, it's all emails. Except I didn't much like Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda. I'm going to stop saying the title soon because it's long. But the reason that I didn't like it was, or I didn't love it, it was okay, you know. And the reason for that was that I found a lot of the cultural references were quite off-putting, especially for me as a British reader. Simon's school was nothing like school that, you know, as I knew it, as I experienced it. And um, even the cultural references and things like some of the music that's mentioned and stuff, I could see how that could kind of exclude people. But... There's a similar thing here, except for me, it really, I re did really relate to it. I thought a lot of the, the, you know, the, the events that happened in their school and that kind of thing and the different crowds of people they had reminded me a lot more of my own school. And as did the music choices as well and what the kids were listening to. This is an epistolary, I can't say it, it's an epistolary novel where it means that basically it's written in the form of letters. So it's always a dear friend and then generally love always Charlie as well. I was a little bit worried when I found out that it was written epistolary because it, it doesn't always work, you know. But in this one, I really think it did work and I, I really I really enjoyed it. A lot of the stuff as well, he, uh, he builds up a relationship with his teacher and his teacher suggests books that he might like to read and so there are a lot of references to the different books and, you know, he writes reports on them. And actually when I was in school, we had this thing in our English class where every time we read a book you had to write a review of it, which is what I still do in my book blog now, but um, at the time other kids were reading maybe one or at most two books a term. Whereas I was doing four books a week and so I had to keep writing loads and loads of reviews until the teacher eventually said I could stop because that kind of wasn't the point of it. The system didn't work for me, man. He even says here, Charlie, when he's writing his letters, he says, uh, The teacher has assigned us a few chapters at a time, but I do not like to read books like that. I am halfway through the first time. And this is To Kill a Mockingbird, by the way. But when we used to do that in school, we used to have to... It would go around the classroom and people would read from the book 
and I used to just ignore what they were doing and just read ahead. So I was always 100 pages ahead and I actually used to get in trouble when it was my turn to read because I had no idea where we were because they were, you know, halfway back through the story. I also used to spoil the ending because people used to want to know what happened. So I'd be like, okay, well, this happens and then that happens. You get to see into Charlie's head much more in the, in the book because of the letters as opposed to in the movie. You're kind of watching him, but you don't necessarily always know what he's thinking and how his mind works. So this is an interesting little bit here where he basically he meets he meets his friends who are his friends throughout the book. So it's Patrick and Sam and he thinks Sam's beautiful. So he asks, how long have you been going out? And they start laughing and he says, what's so funny? We're brother and sister, Patrick said, still laughing. But you don't look alike, I said. That's when Sam explained that they were actually stepsister and stepbrother since Patrick's dad married Sam's mom. I was very happy to know that because I would really like to ask Sam on a date someday. I really would. She is so nice. I feel ashamed though because that night I had a weird dream. I was with Sam and we were both naked and her legs were spread over the sides of the couch and I woke up and I had never felt that good in my life. But I also felt bad because I saw her naked without her permission. I think that I should tell Sam about this, and I really hope it does not prevent us from maybe making up inside jokes of our own. It would be very nice to have a friend again. I would like that even more than a date. Love always, Charlie. From the book, you do really get this big developed picture of who Charlie is, and it totally took away any worries that I had about the maybe the you know the style of writing in the letters, and um, also I suppose of writing about somebody who's a bit different. You know, it's never really clarified in either the book or the movie as far as I'm aware, you know, whether he's on the autistic spectrum or anything like that, um, whether he's just a weird kid. I was always a weird kid, so, but um, it's, 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 I, I like that fact that it's not made a big deal of, it's just his personality. Some of the letters, it's quite funny as well sometimes as well, so we have here, October 14th, 1991. Dear friend, do you know what masturbation is? I think you probably do because you are older than me, but just in case, I will tell you. Masturbation is when you rub your genitals until you have an orgasm. Wow! I thought that in those movies and television shows when they talk about having a coffee break that they should have a masturbation break. But then again, I think this would decrease productivity. I'm only being cute here. I don't really mean it. I just wanted to make you smile. I meant the wow though. There's a great quote from a dude called Bill. And it does cause some problems as well, <laughs> this conversation that they're talking about. But he says, Charlie, we accept the love we think we deserve. Which seems very true to me. Then Bill, okay, so Bill is the teacher, that's right. And um, basically Charlie tells him about some some problems at home. It, her, his uh, sister is having some problems with, with her boyfriend. And so Bill, the teacher, puts in a call to, the, to, the, to his parents. But then Bill gives him Peter Pan. And uh, he says here, I know what you're thinking. The cartoon Peter Pan with the Lost Boys. The actual book is so much better than that. It's just about this boy who refuses to grow up. And when Wendy grows up, he feels very betrayed. At least that's what I got out of it. I think Bill gave me the book to teach me a lesson of some kind. There are definitely some trigger warnings. Um, I don't know whether the book is darker than the movie, but it does sometimes feel like it, especially going back to it now. So, um, yeah. Ba basically, someone, somebody, a girl says no, and uh, Dave, Dave just talks off to her about how good she looked and things like that, and she grabbed his penis with her hands and started moving it. I wish I could describe this a little more nicely without using words like penis, but that was the way it was. After a few minutes, the boy pushed the girl's head down and she started to kiss his penis. She was still crying. Finally, she stopped crying because he put his penis in her mouth, and I don't think you can cry in that position. But what? I don't know, I think with stuff like that, again, it's really hard to handle it as a writer and also as a reader, I think, but I think seeing it through Charlie's eyes, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, it adds, it adds something, I think. Charlie also gets really into writing as well, so I like that as well. So he says here, I've decided that maybe I want to write when I grow up. I just don't know what I would write. I thought about maybe writing for magazines just so I could see an article that didn't say things like I mentioned before. And he quotes common magazine style. So, as so-and-so wiped the honey mustard off her lips, she spoke to me about her third husband and the healing power of crystals. But honestly, I think I would be a very bad reporter because I can't imagine sitting across the table from a politician or a movie star and asking them questions. I think I would probably just ask for their autograph for my mom or something. I would probably get fired for doing this. So I thought about maybe writing for a newspaper instead because I could, because I could ask regular people questions. But my sister says that newspapers always lie. 
I do not know if this is true, so I'll just have to see when I get older. This also sounds true, I think a lot of people can relate about this when <laughs> when old people get drunk. No offence, old people. <laughs> they usually start when my mum's dad, my grandfather, finishes his third drink. It is around this time that he starts to talk a lot. My grandfather usually just complains about black people moving into the old neighbourhood, and then my sister gets upset at him, and then my grandfather tells her that she doesn't know what she's talking about because she lives in the suburbs, and then he says how no one visits him in his retirement home, and finally he starts talking about all of the family's secrets, like how cousin so-and-so knocked up that waitress from the big boy. I should probably mention that my grandfather can't hear very well, so he says all of these things really loud. My sister tries to fight him, but she never wins. My grandfather is definitely more stubborn than she is. My mum usually helps her aunt prepare the food, which my grandfather always says is too dry, even if it's soup. And her aunt will then cry and lock herself in the bathroom. The problem is, she says, there's only one bathroom in the house and everyone's drinking. And they can't go in there because the aunt's crying, so the guys have to go outside and we in the garden. Um, so Charlie makes a mixtape for his friend Patrick for Secret Santa. And it talks about it here, so... The first present is going to be a mixtape. I just know that it should. I already have the songs picked in a theme. It's called One Winter, but I've decided not to hand colour the cover. The first side has a lot of songs by the village people and Blondie because Patrick likes that type of music a lot. It also has Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, which Sam and Patrick love. But the second side is the one I like the most. It has winter kind of songs. Here they are. Asleep by The Smiths. Vapor Trail by Ride. Scarborough Fair by Simon and Garfunkel. A Whiter Shade of Pale by Procol Harum, Time of No Reply by Nick Drake, Dear Prudence by The Beatles, Gypsy by Suzanne Vega, Nights in White Satin by The Moody Blues, Daydream by Smashing Pumpkins, Dusk by Genesis before Phil Collins was even in the band, MLK by U2, Blackbird by The Beatles, Landside by Meet Fleetwood Mac, and finally Asleep by The Smiths again. Which sounds like a pretty good mixtape. And my girlfriend was saying as well, she thinks it's a shame that nobody makes mixtapes anymore. So I think now I'm going to have to make her one. Ugh. New mixtapes Yeah, new mixtapes are Spotify playlists. I also think it's really cute that Sam gets Charlie a typewriter as well. I've, I've tried to get a typewriter multiple times and they never last very long because as soon as anything gets damaged or whatever, and I damage things all the time because I'm useless, they stop working and then they're hard to repair. There's also some stuff with his Aunt Helen and uh, a birthday present, which if you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. It's all very sad. I thought it was actually clever the way it had been sort of, you know, worked in as, because it, it, that kind of thing could happen coincidentally as well, but you would blame yourself and yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. I like just some, just some of the lines and just the way, the things that Charlie thinks to talk about, I just find interesting. So he says here, this other time I saw a commercial for this movie about a man who was accused of murder, but he didn't commit the murder. A guy from MASH was the star of the movie. That's probably why I remember it. The commercial said that the whole movie was about him trying to prove that he was innocent and how he could go to jail anyway. That scared me a lot. It scared me how much it scared me. Being punished for something you did not do, or being an innocent victim. It's just something that I never want to experience. And I think that stands out to me because it is that kind of, this kind of age, you're, you know, you're coming of age when you start to realise that actually the world isn't always a just and fair place. Sometimes bad things happen to good people and vice versa. And, you know, some people who are being punished for crimes didn't commit the crime. Some people commit crimes and don't get punished. The world sucks, man. There's a thing as well, actually. I've only just realised this coming back through through my notes that in the book, his sister has an abortion and he goes with her to the abortion clinic. And I don't recall that being in the movie. But it's kind of touching that she takes him along with her, especially considering some of the things that have happened between them and the dy dynamic between them and their relationship. You know, they have a very love-hate relationship, as I suppose most brothers and sisters do. I'm technically an only child. I have a half-brother and half-sister, but they're ten years older than me. I'm going to read a little excerpt from there, actually. So, dear friend, I was sitting in the waiting room of the clinic. I'd been there for an hour or so. I don't remember exactly how long. Bill had given me a new book to read, but I just couldn't concentrate on it. I guess it makes sense, why not? Then I tried to read some magazines, but again, I just couldn't. It wasn't so much that they mentioned what the people were eating, it was all the magazine covers. Each one had a smiling face, and every time it was a woman on the cover, she was showing her cleavage. I wondered if those women wanted to do that to look pretty, or if it was just part of the job. I wondered if they had a choice or not, if they wanted to be successful. I just couldn't get that thought out of my mind. I could almost see the photo shoot and the actress or model going to eat a light lunch with her boyfriend afterward. I couldn't see him asking her about her day and how she wouldn't think too much of it, or maybe if it was her first magazine cover, how she would be very excited because she was starting to become famous. 
I could see the magazine on the newsstands and a lot of anonymous eyes looking at it, and how some people would think it was very important. And then how a girl like Mary Elizabeth would be very angry about the actress or model showing her cleavage along with all the other actresses and models doing the same thing, or some photographer like Craig would just look at the quality of the photograph. Then I thought there would be some men who would buy the magazine and masturbate to it, and I wondered what the actress or her boyfriend thought about that, if they did at all. And then I thought that it was about time for me to stop thinking because it wasn't doing my sister any good. That's when I started thinking about my sister. So he takes his, his sister home and, you know, she, she makes him promise not to tell her parents and all this stuff and, he, and he's fine. He says, uh, that's when I shut the door and left her to sleep. I didn't feel like reading that night, so I went downstairs and watched a half hour long commercial that advertised an exercise machine. They kept flashing a 1-800 number, so I called it. The woman who picked up the other end of the phone was named Michelle. And I told Michelle that I was a kid and did not need an exercise machine, but I hoped she was having a good night. That's when Michelle hung up on me, and I didn't mind a bit. Love always, Charlie. And I just think little things like that really, you know, communicate his personality and what he is like as a person. And also with his, you know, his, I guess, doomed relationship with, with Mary Kate or Ashley or whatever she's called. And um, it was, you know, he does he does some, some bad things to her, I guess, but... He doesn't even realise that they are bad and, and actually it's because he's been put in these impossible situations by people and he's not very good at dealing with people. And again, I kind of relate to, I don't like dealing with people. He says, he ends up seeing a psychiatrist. He says, I know that I brought this all on myself. I know that I deserve this. I'd do anything not to be this way. I'd do anything to make it up to everyone and to not have to see a psychiatrist who explains to me about being passive aggressive. And to not have to take the medication he gives me, which is too expensive for my dad. And to not have to talk about bad memories with him, or be nostalgic about bad things. Which again, I think if anyone's had any experience with therapy and stuff like that, it uh, kind of reminds me of how I feel. So then they start sharing some of the school legends as well. So there were other stories and other names. Second base Stace, who had breasts in the fourth grade and let some of the boys feel them. Vincent, who took acid and tried to flush a sofa down the toilet. Sheila, who allegedly masturbated with a hot dog and had to go to the emergency room. The list went on and on. By the end, all I could think was what these people must feel like when they go to their class reunions. I wonder if they were embarrassed, and I wondered if that's a small price to pay for being a legend. There are definitely some people like that that I went to school with whose stories I could tell you, but <laughs> I don't think they would thank me for putting that up on the internet, so... I think the only thing in the entire book actually, the only kind of Americanism that I didn't really understand was valedictorian. I don't know what that is, so I'm going to ask. Hey Google, what does valedictorian mean? Valedictorian in North America, a student who delivers the valedictory at a graduation ceremony. Okay Google, what's a valedictory? Valedictory, serving as a farewell. They could have just said a farewell speech, that would have saved some time, but anyway. I'm just going to end with this one last quote from near the end of the book, and because uh, I think it it shares some of Charlie's philosophy on life, and actually there's stuff we can learn from him, and that's shown throughout the book, you know, the other characters learn things about themselves or about the world from him, even though at first, I, I think they would, at first, uh, first, you know, glance or whatever, they'd probably discount him. And that's one of the perks of being a wallflower. It's like if I blame my Aunt Helen, I would have to blame her dad for hitting her and the friend of the family that fooled around with her when she was little and the person that fooled around with him and God for not stopping all this and things that are much worse. And I did do that for a while, but then I just couldn't anymore because it wasn't going anywhere, because it wasn't the point. I'm not the way I am because of what I dreamt and remembered about my Aunt Helen. That's what I figured out when things got quiet. And I think that's very important to know. It made things feel clear and together. Don't get me wrong, I know what happened was important, and I needed to remember it. But it's like when my doctor told me the story of these two brothers whose dad was a bad alcoholic. One brother grew up to be a successful carpenter who never drank. The other brother ended up being a drinker as bad as his dad was. When they asked the first brother why he didn't drink, he said that after he saw what it did to his father, he could never bring himself to even try it. When they asked the other brother, he said that he guessed he learned how to drink on his father's knee. So I guess we are who we are for a lot of reasons, and maybe we'll never know most of them. But even if we don't have the power to choose where we come from, we can still choose where we go from there. We can still do things, and we can try to feel okay about them. So all in all, as you can probably tell from my review slash discussion, I really enjoyed this book. I actually gave it a 5 out of 5. 
Really, I don't think I can find many things that I could improve about it. Maybe explain what valedictorian means, and that's about it. And uh, the movie was good as well, but the book was definitely better. And I just think it's one that everyone should read. I mean, it's compared on the front to uh, The Catcher in the Rye, but I preferred this to Catcher in the Rye. Mainly because Holden Caulfield's a little shit, but, you know... Yeah, fantastic book. And I kind of just wish I'd read it when I was younger. So anyway, there we have it. That's what I thought of The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Be sure to let me know in the comments if you've read it and or watched the movie. I'd love to discuss it with you guys. And in the meantime, please do hit the like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more bookish videos. And I will see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.